Hello, Samara. Thank Hello. you so much for joining us. Very lucky to have Samara today. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey in finance and your role as CIO of ETF and index investing at BlackRock? Sure, and uh, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here and to see a lot of you who I know. Um, I will say, given my 30-ish uh, year career in markets and finance, I'm, not, I'm still trying to digest the fact that all 30 years has been 1.0, and we're only now entering 2.0. Um, but uh, but I'll, I'll sit with that for a little bit. Um, I really think of the, uh, the kind of through line throughout my career as having a huge passion for modernizing markets and making them more accessible. So when I uh, was at university, I was a dual major in financial engineering, but also in theater. All of my work experience was in theater, not on stage, but like backstage sort of stuff. But I had no idea when I started working really the difference between different financial firms, but I knew I wanted to see what my financial engineering major could do in the real world. And I was really attracted at that time to the BlackRock story, which was at that time a very small, I, I was employee number 134, so this was a small, fixed income portfolio management firm created by a bunch of sell-side structurers and engineers that wanted to make the bond market and risk management in the bond market accessible to more people. And I liked that story, and so I went to work there. Um, I actually was gone from BlackRock for about 18 years because I went to business school and then I went to Goldman Sachs and spent that part of my career uh, in the derivatives market. And, and kind of the, the last turning point, I would say, that, that brings me here was the global financial crisis in 2008. So I was sitting in the kind of heart of uh, the, the derivatives market, and, and specifically in the post-crisis response, um, the uh, uh, um, interest rate market, which was where I had spent most of my career, really felt a lot of the, the kind of post-crisis reforms that were unfolding in the markets. And as much as, you know, as a career at that point derivatives professional, I had and still do have total conviction that derivatives were not the root cause of the financial crisis, I also had conviction that the OTC markets could be made much more transparent, resilient, and accessible. And I wanted the next part of my career to be doing that. That led me to doing a lot of market structure strategy work at Goldman and then rejoining BlackRock for these things they told me were called ETFs. But when BlackRock reached out to me, like I had to Google what an ETF was because in 2014 in the bond market, like nobody knew what an ETF was. And that tells you the, the kind of trajectory of bond ETFs and ETFs in general that now you can't have a credible conversation in the bond market without knowing what an ETF is. And I think there's probably a, a number of analogs here to, to the story of crypto. But really, I became convinced over the course of this conversation with BlackRock that exchange-traded products were actually a disruptive technology that was going to bring more access um, and, and transparency to markets. And so I came to BlackRock and, and you know, uh, uh, came into the seat that I, that I am now, which is Chief Investment Officer of ETFs. Wow, thank you. Yeah, certainly a lot of parallels between what you've experienced and what we're seeing now in crypto. Um, if you think about crypto and traditional finance, you know, what do you think each industry does well, and what do you think they have to learn from each other? So I uh, knew you were going to ask me this question, and I have to say, I'm pretty sure you answered it as well or better than I will in your keynote, because this is kind of exactly what you talked about, so I'm glad I had the opportunity to, to listen to it. But I'll make a couple of additional um, comments. I think the arc of you know, market modernization, like really for millennia, and I love getting really nerdy about markets history, so I could go deep on that, but you know, I won't, you're welcome, but um, has been this kind of inexorable drive towards better transparency, resilience, and access. And so unquestionably, if blockchain technology was, you know, uh, if we could today whiteboard how we would design a modern financial system, like 
blockchain technology has huge promise across all three of those dimensions. Now, in terms of, you know, legacy finance and, and TradFi, I think that things that are the most important and relevant today, which, you know, you also spoke to in your keynote, one in particular, is, of course, regulation. I'm thrilled you have an incredible lineup of speakers who can bring a lot of expertise around the path forward for regulation, but I think one of the key uh, takeaways here for this group, especially like given all the atmospherics around deregulation in the world right now, is that regulation is actually going to be really important for crypto, particularly in the United States, to increase confidence and to create the balance that historically U.S. markets have gotten right. I would say the last five years have been a bit of a, you know, departure from this with respect to crypto. But that balance between um, really sound and smart guardrails and innovation, which, you know, brings people to commit capital and want to participate in this space. Um, and then the last point I want to make is actually on guardrails. And this is where I think there are particularly a number of uh, lessons and best practices uh, to be shared. And, and I know we'll, we'll probably talk a little bit more around 24-7. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, TradFi markets have been tested in lots of different uh, scenarios and have come up with many mechanisms around, you know, uh, uh, circuit breakers and kill switches and, you know, uh, interoperability, the self-help that exchanges provide to each other to navigate those moments of crisis and, you know, think of as high-velocity markets. And I think learnings there will be very important for crypto going forward. Maybe we can look a little more specifically at tokenization and the rise of ETFs. What are the sort of parallels that you would see in those domains? So um, I think the, uh, I mean, look, the crypto ETP story, and, and I'll pause for any of you who, who don't know the kind of minutia here, exchange traded product is like the Uber category. I know everybody talks about uh, exchange traded funds, but actually the crypto ETPs are exchange traded products. They're not funds. If we refer to them as uh, ETFs, we can't uh, use that conversation or activate it on social media. So we try to be very careful saying ETP, but really um, it's, it's just a, a bigger category. When we were first approached about a Bitcoin ETP, it was actually, and it was, you know, years before uh, uh, we, and, and kind of early in BlackRock's digital assets journey, um, we actually had to think about, like, why do you need the ETP wrapper for crypto? And this gets back to your earlier question around what are the benefits of kind of the, the TradFi financial system and, you know, what are the best practices that, that can be shared? But, um, but if I think about like what, you know, Bitcoin is transparent, I, you know, the first time I buy, bought Bitcoin, I timed myself and I was able to do it inside of two minutes on my mobile phone. So that's kind of the definition of, you know, accessible. Um, and, and so these things that really like turbocharged us to come into work every day, like bringing access to high yield bonds where you needed institutional coverage and a dealer in order to literally buy a bond, like we get excited all day about providing an ETF so you can do that on your phone, but we didn't quite get the value prop of the Bitcoin ETP wrapper. And really what we learned were a few things that, um, first of all, it wasn't, you know, particularly things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, transparency, liquidity, understanding depth of liquidity, those weren't as uh, accessible, particularly to um, institutional investors. Uh, custody was complex. Uh, and lastly, as investors started to think about how they might allocate to Bitcoin in the context of their overall portfolio, they wanted a mechanism to view whole portfolio risk and this living in two ecosystems. You know, first of all, it's very hard to go back and forth unless you're living your life on chain. And second of all, it's hard to kind of look at holistic uh, risk management. So that was kind of the bridge where we actually took a crypto asset and brought it, you know, into a, a TradFi wrapper and moved forward that way. Now, to your question on, you know, the trajectory of tokenization, and you spoke to this, um, like, incredibly well in your keynote, I think um, there are lots of parts of markets that work well. Collateral 
and the cash kind of ecosystem, uh, particularly in this you know, era of uh, rising rates and you know, increased capital requirements for banks, that part of the ecosystem needs to be able to move um, with more agility and less friction. So tokenizing cash and collateral-like assets has a huge potentially systemic benefit that kind of goes the other way. You're taking you know, a, uh, um, a TradFi uh, asset, or in the case of a treasury fund, you know, sophisticated treasury management capabilities, and actually moving that on chain. One of the things that we talk about repeatedly at Ondo is why we're not focused on tokenizing illiquid assets, right? And our belief that tokenization does not bring liquidity. Um, you know, how do you think about similarly what an ETF does with respect to changing the liquidity profile of an asset? Yeah, it's such a great question, and, and we've talked about this. There's such a parallel, and I hope that um, uh, one of the things you know you take from this conversation, if if anything, is is that that you know tokenizing something or you know putting it in an ETP wrapper does not magically create volume and liquidity. Like that's a mythology. A market needs like a certain level of um, uh, uh, demand, participation, uh, infrastructure in order to actually unlock the benefits of that technology, whether that technology is an ETP wrapper or that's tokenization. Now, at that point, we can measurably show that markets with ETPs in them um, generally have more uh, um, transparency, price formation, resilience than markets without them. And I think the same will absolutely be true for tokenization, um, that markets that support uh, tokenization as a wrapper for assets gives an invest investors another tool that will be um, good for that market's kind of resilience and quality, um, but it still has to be introduced at kind of the appropriate time of, of market development. There's a lot of excitement in crypto about what the new administration is going to do for the space, hopefully bringing regulatory clarity. Do you think that excitement is overblown? You know, how do you think about uh, you know, how the digital asset space will benefit from or react to the sort of changing administration? Um, so I'm excited and optimistic. Um, I think it's really hard. And I, one of the observations I have, because I kind of live in the middle, I'm much more, I, I would say, kind of TradFi fluent than I am crypto fluent. But I can tell you categorically from the time I've spent kind of bringing people together on both sides of that um, to, you know, in particular to, to make uh, ETPs work, um, is there are very few people that are bilingual in both. There are a ton of smart crypto people that know they need a better path forward from a regulatory and policy perspective, but they're not quite sure what to ask for. And there's a lot of people who understand kind of current systems of of regulation that don't understand crypto. And so actually creating the clarity of um, what that path looks for, I think is a more challenging task than um, many may realize. I, you guys obviously get it. You're gonna spend a fair amount of time here today hearing from some of I, people who I think are the best thinkers in this space. But I think it's really important, and, and I hope, I'm the um, chair of the, uh, uh, we call it the Digital Assets Task Force at SIFMA, which is a Securities uh, Industry Association. It's really important that we spend the time so, to come up with an appropriately interoperable regime. And you, know, you said it again a number of times in your keynote, I think this is a pivotal time in markets and there's a number of paths that we could go down. And there is a path where you develop a crypto ecosystem that works pretty well in parallel to the TradFi ecosystem. That's not what's best for investors. What's best for investors, but, but it may be sometimes, and you have to really think big, because what I've seen in the past is that you know, we see this a lot with exchanges in, in Europe, for example. You get very focused on. I want a bigger share of 
my pie and I'm gonna focus on that at the expense of creating a bigger pie. This is the moment to think about a bigger pie um, you know, versus uh, how you might compete in a crypto only world. But I think that there's you know, a lot of uh, work that has to be done to actually articulate how that works. Yeah, I could not agree more. I think we're still in such early innings of tokenization that you know, we should really all have a very collaborative mindset. Um, and yeah, it's been great to work together on sort of Viddle and, and related initiatives. Um, cool, well, I think that's all the time we have for now, but thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Have a great day.